Hello everyone, and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to cover everything you need to know about EIP-1559 in 6 minutes. By the time this video ends, you're going to be an expert. So before we get into 1559, it's important to go over the current model. Now the current model is an auction-based model, meaning that users bid how much gas they're willing to spend to get their transaction put in on the next block. Now on the left here, you can see the gas estimates for low, average, and high. And basically the more you're willing to spend on gas, the faster your transaction should execute. Now this might seem to make sense, but there's actually three significant drawbacks with the current mechanism. Now the first problem is that all of the fees that the user spends actually go to the miner. So so there's no direct value accrual to the network itself if there's a lot of transaction volume. The second problem is right now there's no way to guarantee a transaction actually goes through. One example of this is the recent NFT craze. Um, so in the block before an NFT drops, gas might be normal, and then as soon as that NFT drops, the gas price spikes to an absurd level. And the last problem with this auction mechanism is there's a lot of cases where the user is actually overpaying on gas when they didn't need to. So for example, in this current model, let's say I really need a transaction to go through on the very next block, I might bid a crazy gas price to make sure that happens. Now my transaction may very well go through, but I might have also overpaid for the gas there. I might not have needed to spend that much to ensure the transaction would happen in the next block. So let's talk about the new fee structure with EIP-1559. So the important thing here is there's three fees built into 1559, and the first is base fee. So this base fee is actually set by the network itself, and it's always burned, meaning if the base fee is 15 GUE, that GUE is going to get burnt no matter what, so that ETH supply will just be destroyed. The base fee is basically the minimum you need to spend to get included in a block, and this varies based on the network demand. The next fee type is the priority fee or tip set by the user. So this tip is paid directly to miners and it's to incentivize them to include a transaction in the next block. It's estimated that the default will be 2 GUE, uh, but it's worth noting that the more you're willing to spend on a tip, the faster your transaction will process. Lastly, there's the max fee that a user can set and that's the most they're willing to spend on a transaction. So the max fee basically gets rid of the overbidding problem. Whatever isn't needed that's part of that max fee gets returned to the user, which is obviously a great thing. Again, all credit to the Daily GUE for a lot of this information and that graph. Now the next big change with EIP-1559 is adaptive block size, and again, all credit to the Daily GUE for this image. So as you can see on the top, this is what blocks look like before EIP-1559. You can see they're all the same price regardless of how expensive gas is. Now in the lower half of the image, you can see what the network looks like after 1559, and you can see that the block expands or contracts based on demand. So with a variable block size, the network can better smooth out gas price volatility, which is obviously very beneficial to the user. So what are the benefits to all of these changes? Well, in my estimation, there's five key things here. The first is better user experience. So users can now better estimate gas costs, and they actually have their overpayments returned to them, which is great. Now the next major benefit is a fluctuating block size. But you can see the benefit of a fluctuating block size is you can better enforce a longer term average block size limit, but allow for variation across individual blocks. So what this means is we can keep the blocks relatively small to ensure decentralization, but when we need to expand the block size we can, and when we need to shrink it we can as well, which is obviously beneficial to the network. Third are the security benefits. So with a more sustainable ETH distribution model, we can increase the duration of minor rewards if we have to, without massively increasing inflation in the future. The example of this is the Bitcoin problem. How are transactions mined when there's no more mining reward and BTC inflation stops? Well, this is a way for Ethereum to prevent that problem from ever happening. Now, the fourth major benefit is that Ethereum network activity directly benefits the network by burning ETH. So what this means is that the more transaction volume there is on Ethereum, the more ETH gets burned and the more value goes back to Ethereum holders. The last benefit is that it's possible that in the very short term, we could see lower gas prices. This isn't sustainable though, and we are going to have to depend on proof of stake in our L2s to get lower gas. The fact is that increasing block size only temporarily helps because theoretically more transactions will happen and get crammed into the same blocks driving up gas prices. So the big question on everyone's mind now is, is ETH going to become deflationary? But there's two answers to this question. So the first is under proof of work or ETH1. Now under ETH1, 
there's a lot of issuance of ETH under proof of work because the miners have to expend a lot of energy to mine ETH. What that means is that a base fee of 150 GUE would need to be sustained to offset the current ETH1 issuance. We've seen that in very frothy bull markets, but it's hard to imagine that the average gas price would be 150 GUE in a regular market. The next part of that question is what happens under proof of stake or ETH2? Well, once the merge happens and ETH goes fully to proof of stake, we'll only need a base fee of 20 GUE to offsite the issuance of proof of stake. That's because you need to issue less ETH to secure the network under proof of stake because it's less costly to validate transactions. So the answer is that it's not likely that we'll see deflationary ETH under proof of work. Obviously, NFT drops are the exception when gas spikes, uh, but it is very possible that we could see deflationary ETH under proof of stake. The main question here is if scaling will decrease deflationary forces since a lot of the activity happens on different L2s or side chains. That said, all of these true L2s have to use Ethereum for their main security, so they're going to be spending a lot of ETH on mainnet, and so we do think that ETH will be deflationary after proof of stake, or it should be on average. Now, I will also include a link to watchtheburn.com. Uh, once 1559 goes through in a couple of days, you can click that link and you can watch and see how much ETH is actually getting burned on a per block basis, which is really exciting. If you like the video, please share it with friends that are trying to learn more about Ethereum. Please like the video, subscribe, and hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I release a new video. Now, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.